I'll just let it record and I can turn around. Let me see if we can get it. Are you all set? We're recording? Oh, yeah. Sound? Why? That was like at the end. I think I'm going to be your friend. At the end of it, I was like, this is incredible. It's not just this. What is it at the end? Yeah, but stand it. Yes, 100%. When I start. The cooking mic is on. Is that why? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hello. Maybe I'll keep that in your oh, that's better. <laughs> I think I might. No, it's still. Oh, I know what it is. Janine needs to mute. Oh, okay. Hello. She'll need to um be muted, and that's where it's coming from. I'm gonna mute her. Wait, is this? Okay. Did that work? Hello. Yeah. Oh, she needs to mute her computer. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. Better. Very complicated. Yeah. So everything should be good to go. Great. Mm -hmm. Yep. This here. Yep. This is what I have. This one. So still looks good. And we're recording. We are also still got ten minutes. Yeah. If you. Are doing like chat, so um, I'm not gonna miss. I'm so not yeah. used to this. Janine will do, will take care of the chat for us. Okay, so, so we yeah. don't have to worry about that. Okay. Okay. okay, all right, okay. I will be next door for the next 15 minutes, okay. so and then I will probably be back in the library. So um, if you maybe just give me a call at the office, great. I can... And so people on Zoom should see that, right? Yes, is there a pen? Is there a pen? Uh, I think Laura Jane has your number. Okay, well, I was just going to um, write down oh, the office extension great. and my number. All right. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we're all set. We're just flipping through the slides. All right, and this we can minimize. There you go. If you have any Unless you want to see it, but you don't need to. I probably don't want to see it. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's like when you're right. on Zoom, it's just so great. Thing. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank yeah. you so much. So, yeah, we're set. And Janine, you should be a co host. You should be good to go. Yes, I think I am. Great. All right. So, we so I'm going to show here. Okay. Mary suggested wisely, should I get a little paint from <laughs> I'll try to do it standing, but you know, with the mask it gets and when you're standing it's harder. Mm -hmm. The brakes, yeah. Yeah, totally. And that was when I worked at it. I really need it. I really need it. I'm good. 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 I'm <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I was just even dating them for the thought that it's so nerve wracking. You see so many people arriving, which is great. Good. Yay! Hi! It is nice. That room was very cool.
Because you just have slides. I don't have any videos. <laughs>
And we had like, we were issued our like the very Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Janine Culligan, and I'm the director and curator of the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum. Uh, and I want to welcome Rita Moss to Hollins and welcome all of you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's great to see you in person. Um, and thanks for spending the evening with us. Um, I just have a few house rules. Uh, one thing, if you could first uh, please quiet your cell phones if you haven't. Um, and keep your mask on, as you all know, in keeping with the culture of care. Um, this presentation has both a live and a virtual audience. Uh, Rita Moss will talk for approximately 40 minutes and will then take questions from the audiences. Uh, so be thinking of those excellent questions. Uh, the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum will be open until 8 o'clock, and it's a great opportunity to see Rita Moss's exhibition as well as the other two exhibits currently on view. So here, I wanna tell you a little bit about the Artist in Residence program. In 1997, an anonymous donor established an endowment for, to fund the Francis Niederer Artist in Residence program. This endowment named for beloved art history professor, Dr. Francis J. Niederer, who taught here from 1942 to 1980 allows the university to bring a nationally recognized artist to campus each year. In residence during the spring semester, each visiting artist creates work in a campus studio and teaches an art seminar course open to students of all disciplines. During the visit, Hollins presents a public lecture, here we are, um, by the visiting artist and an exhibition of their work in the museum. This program adds variety and depth to the university's academic offerings and contributes to the cultural activities in the greater Roanoke community. Art department faculty select the visiting artists, and this is the 26th year of this amazing program. Uh, many of you know this, most of you know this, but in the first floor hallway 
uh, in the back. It's, it's lined with the works that have been donated by past artists in residence, and their generosity has enabled the museum, which I might add has no earmarked acquisition funds, <laughs> to acquire contemporary works by important contemporary artists working in a variety of mediums. And now without further delay, I turn the podium over to Assistant Professor of Photography at Hollins University, Mary Zampetti, who will introduce me to us. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome Rita Moss, our 2022 Francis Nieder Artist in Residence to Hollins this semester. Rita holds a BFA in Visual Studies from the School of Visual Arts in New York and an MFA in Visual Arts from Lesley University College of Art and Design in Boston. Her work has been widely exhibited nationally and internationally, most recently at the Griffin Museum of Photography in Massachusetts, the Katona Museum of Art in New York, Filter Photo in Chicago, and the Print Center in Philadelphia. Notably, Rita's work was selected for the annual Fresh exhibition at the Klompchen Gallery in New York in 2019. Her work is also included in several collections, including at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, and the Creative Center for Photography in Tucson, Arizona. In addition to being a practicing artist, Rita has recently served as a visiting professor in photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology and as a visiting artist at the City University of New York, Staten Island. For 27 years, Rita was also the owner of an award-winning photography studio in New York. Rita's work is grounded in the materials and methods of photography, while also exploring aspects of drawing and printmaking. Rita masterfully and playfully uses non-representation and abstraction to dissect ideas relating to time, change, order, and control, or the lack thereof. This work compels us to evaluate the everyday through a new lens and is conceptually relevant to these unpredictable times we're currently experiencing. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rita Moss. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, that was really lovely. Ah, thank you everybody for coming here tonight. It's so nice to see so many faces. Um, so here we are. I'm greatly honored to be have been invited to join everybody here at Hollins University. And I really want to thank everybody in the studio department for extending that unique and wonderful invitation to me. Um, let me just make sure I have all my buttons in a row here. Okay. Um, I'm very grateful to be here with you tonight. I want to especially thank Janine Elegant for her thoughtful curation in the exhibi exhibition that's on view down, um, outside, and as well as Laura Jane and Janet for installing it so beautifully, and also Kyra for helping with this presentation tonight. Um, so, in speaking with you today about the work that's on view at the museum, I thought I'd begin with some of the work that I did before that to sort of give you an idea of how one project leads to another and the basis of my practice. And just note some recurring themes. So I'm going to start with the beginning. <laughs> um, I start, I thought I'd start with this. So this is a work that I did as an undergraduate. Is 1979. SX70 Polaroid was new technology of its time. It was like the new thing. Prior to using this camera, I was using the traditional 35 millimeter film, black and white. And picking up this camera was, whoops, wrong button, <laughs> technical difficulties. Um, what this new technology allowed me to do, it would allow me to create as fast as I could think. While I was doing the black and white, the process was shooting, developing, as many of you know, editing, agonizing over it. And all of a sudden, this technology just compressed that all into five minutes. And the addition of color was also very exciting to me and really opened up a new way for me to think 
about photography. And the other thing, the SX-70s are really uniquely beautiful. They are very, and they really, you can't duplicate them. They're just beautiful little objects. And everybody can hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. So this series grew out of a conceptual project that I was working on at the time. So I was thinking about what exactly is a photograph. I was thinking about at its basic materiality, it's a collection of dyes suspended in plastic. I was also considering the idea that much of what we see and take in every day is really not seen at all, but quickly scanned. Think of the many things, sorry, the mask is getting to me. <laughs> Think of the many things in our homes that we know are there, but we really don't see anymore. There are actual environments. Think of like what you might, the things that you don't see on your daily commute. They're there, you sense them, but you probably haven't seen them in quite some time. Most likely all blocked by internal thoughts. Um, so here in this case, I used the flash bar on the little SX-70 to kind of blow out the color. And in doing that, it took the color and it kind of spread it over the picture, kind of coloring the way you see. So for me, that sort of suggested the per how personal perceptions are colored by what we see. So I bring up this early work today because to just note that how some of these concepts are still present in my work. So materiality, what a photograph is, perception, what we see, and subjectivity, how we filter and receive it. And these are all still evident in my practice and pop up again and again. So if we were to fast forward 30 years, it's 2008. Information is just beginning to be created and distributed in tsunami-like waves. While this has only increased since that time, then I was not quite conditioned to it. And to be honest, it's not really unique to our times. But the, at the time, I found the volume of data I was exposed to on a daily basis to be overwhelming. To put it in context, 2008, Facebook was launched in 2004, YouTube in 2005, Twitter 2006, Instagram hadn't even been invented yet. Radio and television were rapidly expanding their broadcast. I don't even think they had invented podcasts yet. It was actually relatively quiet time. Now it's the water we swim in. But at the time, I was just getting used to the tide. 2008 was an election year. McCain versus Obama after eight years of George W. Bush. Hungry for updates, I likely overindulged on the news cycle. I found that I needed exposure to and shelter from all this information. This series, Reality TV, began as a response to what for me was a nerve wracking time. I focused my attention on the television and its constant beam. I photographed the white wall in a room when a program was running. The assembled images um, of saturated color vibrate against each other, creating their own visual sensation. I selected 12 images from the program and arranged them in a grid to kind of mimic the aspect ratio of a TV set. So this is Top Chef. And I chose to photograph only programs that were loosely classified as reality TV, roughly defined as non-scripted. It includes game shows, the local weather, and historic events. So a second version of this, I recorded the entire show and I assembled the entire, every, every, every capture I made into one long piece to sort of 
show the, the duration of the program. So its format reflects the length of the broadcast. So this is a two hour program. This print is 17 inches. All these printers are 17 inches because that's the size of my printer and by the duration of the length of the program. So dancing with the stars. And I also did sporting events. I chose the World Cup soccer because it has a predetermined beginning and end, unlike baseball, which could go on, you know, forever. Um, so this is 2010. And I was interested in news as a topic then as well. So that's Keith Oberman. A lot of you probably don't know this guy. Um, and Larry Kang. So he's not exactly a news program. But what I was surprised to find that these three different programs kind of visually look the same under my treatment. Um, but the other thing that surprised me now, looking back, how this series has sort of become a time capsule for its time. A lot of these programs aren't around anymore. And it kind of like, reflects upon that time that we lived in then. And here's biggest loser. I don't even know if that's on anymore. I couldn't resist this. And the perennial Jeopardy. You have to say it. Jeopardy. Um, so that's reality TV. That bring, this brings me to another body of work, mistakes. So during this time, I'm working as a commercial photographer, shooting still lifes um, and food for magazines and advertising clients. So around this time, I switched from shooting four by five transparency film with a large format camera to um, shooting digital. And I adapted my large format camera with a digital back. So old and new technologies don't always seamlessly interact. And my particular cyborg um, arrangement had many quirks. So these photos are a result of a technical miscommunication between the camera and the capture program. In other words, total failures. This is not what your client wants to see on set. <laughs> but after the shoot, I rescued them from the digital file and, oops, hold on, sorry. I rescued them from the digital file and processed them. Um, they're devoid of any outside referential information and were mechanically generated by the system itself. The system refused to copy what was right in front of the camera and the, of the camera lens and displays the particular, particular conditions of the system itself. Created through no intention of my own, they, sorry again, there's my cursor. Created through no intentions of my own, they play with the notions of chance, production, and originality. This series explores the betrayal of what we know about photography, that it, it's a recording of something that exists within our physical world. I contend that the shortcomings and limitations of photography allows for the visualization of the unimaginable. So a few things I'm playing with throughout this project are the reduction of the image, the removal of the narrative, the shift of subject matter, and I'm allowing chance to play a major role. Around 2014, I started a new project, Residual Ink Drawings. I began to think about the physicality of the photograph itself. Again, an echo from my earlier work. I was thinking about how in most cases today, we're most likely to see a photograph on a screen rather than as an actual object. 
Traditionally, a photograph is made of light sensitive, sensitive material using dyes or silver and chemicals. Today, it's just as likely that a physical photograph is ink on paper generated from digital code, one zeros and pixels. Rather than exposing paper to light, specifically coded paper receives ink via a complex series of digital code. Around this time, I started to play with the materials of the digital darkroom. I began by collecting used or empty cartridges, empty from various printers. I began by finding them on eBay. Then after opening the cartridge, I poured the remaining ink directly onto the photo rag paper. I let the ink take whatever form or shape it wants. I then scanned the original drawing and reproduce it using my own inkjet printer. So here, the four drawings on top are the original drawings, and the four on the bottom are digital photographic reproductions. The title of each piece comes from the printer the inks came from, and if I know, who gave me the empty cartridges. The order of the prints are laid out and determined by how the inks are loaded in the printer. So as I began to share this work with other artists, they started to save and collect and share with me their empty cartridges. So I began to work with different kinds of inks. Um, and each what I found was that each manufacturer has its own set of proprietary inks and cartridges. So it was a, um, you know, it was fun and playful. And these are the Canon cartridges that, um, so they're different from the other ones, from the Epson ones. I really had to smash these. So the, 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 the Epson cartridges have little pouches inside with the ink, but these somehow had these little tiny felt pads inside that I had to kind of pull out with tweezers. Um, so I, after I retrieved them, I placed them directly on the paper and then placed another sheet of paper on top and just applied pressure to kind of squeeze the ink out. Again, the results are a surprise to me. I then scan and reproduce as before. So here the top prints are the original and the bottom prints are the inkjet prints. So in this particular case, um you could see it doesn't match and <laughs> you could see that the bottom ones are it just to show you how difficult it is to reproduce the pure pigments because on top it's pure pigments and then you're trying to reproduce them using you know the cymk coded system it's like so the ones on top are all chance and the ones at the bottom are very, very, very controlled as much as I can. So many of the cartridges that come my way are from this printer that might be familiar to some of you. Um, it's the Epson Pro Stylus 3880 and for many years, the industry workforce. So to make this work, I take a whole set of those inks and I line them up and open the nozzles using various tools and strap them together. And then I put a piece of paper on top of it with a piece of plexiglass and I kind of just flip it over and then watch the inks pour out onto the paper through the plexi and then would flip it back and then pull the paper. So the action of pulling the paper gives you those drips. Come on. And then I scan and reproduce the original and place them side by side. So what's driving me to do this? So what I'm thinking about, the most basic premise of photography is that a photograph is essentially a reproduction of something or a representation of something. Generally, we won't confuse the object or person depicted in a photograph for the actual object or person, but we accept it as a substitute, a surrogate, or a memory, um, a, a memory of, a reminder of the person or object. 
here, the two prints are nearly identical. By placing them side by side, I ask the viewer to examine the two and the act of looking, they become participants in the work. The materiality and the appearance of the two prints are similar. Yet one is generated by chance directly from the materials and the other one is a photographic clone translated through digital data. One is something while the other is a representation of something. Aspects of randomness and control are layered with concepts of process and materiality. As the ink block pictures take on the characteristics of a raw shot test, they point to the subjective interpretation of all representation. I'm making photographic copies of photographic material, printmaking materials. The copy is never perfect, and when placed beside its original twin, the slippage becomes apparent. I invite the viewer to carefully examine the difference between the sensibility of touch and that which is derived from poets and pixels. So I don't know if you know what these things are. They are also come out of the um, printers um, upstairs. They are the maintenance tank cartridges and they are designed to collect the ink as the um, printer is doing its cleaning of its head. So you can see the one on the left is brand new. You can see that there's felt in there. The one in the middle is came out of the same printer full. And this one is from a different printer of some sort. And you can see they have those notches um, in the center. So to make this print, I removed those felt pads from the casing and placed it directly on photo rag paper. Again, I took the second piece, put it on top and applied pressure. And this is from the other side of that same cartridge, set of cartridges, felt pads rather. So you can see the notch where that is. And this one, I just, I, after removing the pads from its cartridge, I set them side by side on a sheet of paper, placed the second sheet on top, and again, applied pressure to squeeze out the ink. Again, the materials will do what they want, and I have little control over what will occur. The two prints on the left here are the original, and the two prints on the right are the reproductions. And this is a similar process here. I had three sets of um, the maintenance tank, tank pad, but instead of applying pressure, I lightly soaked the paper and then just let them sit for a couple of weeks. So I let the paper just pull out what inks it could. So a slightly different process. And you can see it's just a little more ghostly than when you apply pressure. And this is the similar process, but with ink pads from a different printer. So they're just, they're just manufactured, they're just different, designed differently. So here are the top two are the original and the bottom two are the prints. So each print is 22 by 17 in this case. And there for scale, you can see, um, see it in installation. So this piece, this is a 16 panel piece. So here, what I did is I made an accordion book of the paper and then I placed it, opened the cartridge and placed it on top and just let the ink sink through the layers. And again, I arranged them as they would be loaded into the printer and then printed a mirror print of each. So you can, you can begin to see how the manufacturer of the printer has determined certain aspects of how the final print will look, the final work will look. So I like to think that I work in collaboration 
with the manufacturer as well as relying on aspects of randomness and chance. And here's that piece in ins installed. And this is 12 four by eight folded pieces of um, paper. And here I decided to invert the copy. So the bottom ones are the copy and I inverted the color. So it's near complementary to kind of evoke the idea of a negative. And here's that one in installed. So about two years ago, I moved, you know, if you've moved your studio ever, you just move boxes, you don't always look to see what's inside. And I got to my new studio and opened up this box and it was filled with ink that I didn't really know I had. Um, so this donation, this donation came from this woman in Portland and I had already made several pieces from what she had sent me. And so I was like, okay, let's deal with this. and. I just sorted through them, took inventory, and went to play. So I thought, let me just put this all in one word. So I had 20 cyan cap cartridges. I opened them up and placed five of them at a time on the paper, and I allowed the ink to just flow and let them sit overnight. So you can see how I take the little stuff out, you know, just little stuff that's in there springs and whatnot. So here's the result, so wet. And here's the second set of five. So you can see two of them had very little ink left in them. And here's the third set of five. So now you can start to see how as the ink soaks into the paper and dries, it lightens up. And this is the fourth set. So you can start to see how I really have very little control how they will eventually look. And I really let the ink take the lead. And this is the finished work from that box. So again, the top prints are the original, the bottoms are the copy. The configuration of the blots in each color is determined by how many cartridges of that part of that color I found in the box. So this printer has a magenta, a red, and orange, and that's what they call a gloss optimizer, why it looks blank. But if you see the actual print, you could see faint stains of uh, liquid on it. And then I found another box. And this had just random blacks in it. Because um, I get a lot of just like blacks. And of course, I can't throw them out. Somebody gave them to me. And so they, they go in a box. And I was like, OK. So these are from all different printers. You can even see how certain, like that one, ink just had totally different properties than the other one. It, they just like spread and they're a little more viscousy. So, and then there were some more gloss optimizers, which again you could see in the real prints. And these are actually all from the same printer with a random orange just floating around, lost his buddies. And here is that piece um, installed. So these are cartridges from the Canon Pixma Pro One, which is um, a Canon that a lot of artists are now switching over to. So I still like the Epson, and many um, schools are doing are using these too. And so this is the full set from that printer. So here, instead of pouring them directly from the cartridge, I kind of harvested the ink out of it and poured them into, poured the ink into little glass jars. And I decided to roll it over the paper 
with a brayer. And also in this case, I thought I'd use glossy paper. So the ink is dries differently on the glossy paper than it does on the matte paper. It just sits on top. It doesn't um, soak in. So it dries fast. And so as I go back and forth, the brayer is leaving marks um, from the action of my hand. And that's the final piece from that project. So again, I inverted the colors. So the top set are the original drawings and the bottom are the reproduction. And this one in particular, when you look at it, you can really see, well, in all of them, you can see the ink, how it sits on the paper as opposed to being like sprayed on the paper. It, the, the original drawings have actual dimension, dimension to them. And there's that piece installed. So this brings me to drawing in three easy steps. So I'm thinking about ways to make a drawing using a set of rules and chance to determine the outcome. I start to play with I started to play with dipping marbles in my ink and allowing the marbles to roll around and create its own drawing. Excellent. So this video shows my methodology of first constructing this corral or stage for the drawing to take place in. I use three different inks, photo black, light black, and light light black. Before allowing the marble to roll, I tap the marble on a separate sheet to kind of remove a little bit of the excess ink. And then I place it within its stage and it becomes a proxy to my hand. While gravity and movement directs the outcome. So I thought they were looking a little tight in the small, so I opened them up a little bit. And then I also got a little better at playing with them. Um, but you know, gravity still had the, the better hand there. So following through with the strategies that I'd set up for my previous work, I scan and reproduce the original drawings. And again, so the materiality of the two are similar, yet one is generated by chance directly from the materials and the other is a photographic copy translated through digital data. The copy is never perfect. And when placed behind, beside the original, the slippage becomes apparent. So within this project, I'm playing with the tropes and myths surrounded, surrounding mid-century abstract painters while still subscribing to their power. So I'm sort of goofing around. And this is the installation in the museum. So while I'm in my studio playing around with my marbles, um, the world goes on. My day typically begins with a cup of coffee while reading the New York Times, like 10 years prior. I am still a daily reader and consumer of the news. 2016. I was away from home on assignment for a year and I started to read the New York Times in its digital format. I kind of missed the paper. I missed the experience of seeing the front page. Um, I discovered that a PDF of the front page is available to download every day. So for reasons unknown to me at the time, I just started to download them and collect them. What I was interested in was how the page creates a sort of hierarchy of news determined by the placement of the headline and size of the font used. So here's a fairly typical um, New York Times front page. 
The lead story is always on the right, the upper right, and it's usually in um, all caps. And printed in the left-hand corner of the page is the paper model motto, all the news that's fit to print. So if the editors decide that the lead story is of significant importance, all cap headlines is used in 30 point font. So that's 30 points. And if it's deemed very important, it appears in 36 point font and expands across the entire front page. And on very special occasions, like man lands on moon, plane hits towers, or Biden beats Trump, this is 72 point font is used. So over time, I started to amass quite a few of these PDFs and I was trying to figure out what to do with them and how to work them into a project that might work with the rules that I've been setting up for myself. Almost all my projects have been working on or structured, structured on some kind of system a set of rules that will determine the outcome of the final project and allowing outside forces to influence it. So I decided on using the structure of the grid of a monthly calendar to map out the headlines. If a day the headline appears in 30 point font, I make a mark using black ink. If the headline exceeds 36 points, I make a mark in red ink. If neither occurs, no mark is made. 72 points got a very heavy red mark. So you can see that third red is heavy. That was the 72. So I decided to examine the headline from the period of November 2016 through January 2021. So I'll just quickly go through this. Here's 2017. Twenty eighteen. Twenty nineteen. Twenty twenty. Yeah, that feels familiar, right? Uh, so, January 2021. This is the final installation of all 51 prints representing that period of time. So I've titled this project, Today I Get Up, emphasizing that no matter what goes on in the world, we get up and get on with our days. Looking back to my reality TV series, there's a few things in common. How news and information is shared, distributed, and consumed are present in both projects. I felt then, as now, that I often feel overwhelmed with the data and statistics that pour over me every day. As one day blurs into the next, comprehension often seems just beyond my grasp. By reducing, or distilling this data, it's for me a way to manage or at least contain it. And here you can see them down here or outside. So this is the back and front of one of the prints. I apply the ink from the back of the paper. So that's the uncoated side of the paper. And it's not designed to receive the ink that way. So when it does, the front size kind of resists it. So it sort of leaves this blurred shadow of a mark. And for me, this application kind of mimics and visualize how our daily experiences are layered, absorbed, and stored within us as we wait for the future to arrive. So this series also has a weekly component. Um, here, I examine a week of headlines using the same criteria as before. I select two words from each headline and place them on the page 
creating sort of concrete poetry. If the point size does not exceed 30 points, the space is left blind. And that's a detail. So again, the ink is applied from the rear with the brush and the font, the front side um, resists the ink when applied in this manner. I push the ink through its fiber using various methods of force, resulting in a blurred, unreadable text. Each print represents a week of headlines. And the weekly series covers the period of December 19th, 2019, when the paper record read in 72 point type across its cover, Trump impeached. And runs through January 21st, 2021, but into the inauguration. So what am I thinking about when I'm doing this? I'm, I'm thinking about how, how to visualize how I feel consuming all this news. That is, one headline replaces, replaces the next. It's easy to forget what the first one was all about. They became la layered and difficult to separate. The blurring of the copy mimics how my memories are felt. So the New York Times, in its attempt to make difficult information more accessible, often implies data visualization. Um, they have really a great department with make wonderful graphs and charts. So this is a chart of the spread of the virus in the United States over the first few months of the pandemic. So you can see the Northeast, you can kind of see the Florida down here and Seattle up there. So I just sort of like pulled in their, their, their little marks. Yeah. So that happened. And this was some other virus related data. And some weeks often offer very few headlines. Today I got up stand as a futile attempt to collate the historic and ephemeral news cycle that we live in. This project pays homage to the seminal work of Ankawara today and I got up. Those works affirmed his own existence and in return ours. It is my hope that this series might offer similar reflections. There are 58 prints in total in this series and I hope you get a chance to see them. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Water. Should I just leave that slide up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Are there any questions in the audience here? I have a question. Okay. So I was really um, like struck as I'm watching this battling between like that looks like an Eden Pride. I love Eden Pride. That looks like a mother well. I love mother and like the like love of the shapes and abstraction and then also being like but she just put the thing on the thing like kind of also questioning the intentionality or or um that kind of mythic quality of, of the beauty of them right so I was wondering like how much like editing after the fact do you do or do you make the prints and then the prints are the prints or do you pick up your favorites how does that element work as you're making your collections very good question um and i too i'm drawn to the ones that remind me of my favorite works yeah. that's why i say um you know i'm goofing around with that the tropes and myths and whatnot but in the meanwhile you know i love them yeah. so yes there is an editing process and i do have a box of um, prints that have never been fully realized and they sit there thinking 
I'll get to those one day. I'll get to those one day. Um, so we'll see if I ever get to them. And I do like to believe that um, that they're all of equal value, but it's kind of hard. The evidence doesn't point to that. Does it? <laughs> I think having a discard pile is great. Right? Yeah. That's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So some of these series could, in reality, go on forever, right? So how how do you decide when a project is over and when you move on to another one? Where is that? How do you draw that line of okay, this is done. Um, well, residual ink drawings is actually an ongoing project, um, and I, I still go back and forth to that over time. Um, but then I picked up the today I got up, and that was pretty all-consuming for um, that period of time. It was pretty much the I started it um, in twenty twenty. Like I went back to all that data that I had been acute, I had already accumulated. In some cases, I had to go back and um, fill in days that I had missed of the uh, front page. So um, I guess I just until I get distracted by something else. <laughs> so, but I did the. I will say that um, that series today I got up I was really grateful to be done with it because it was it was it was hard and I I um like to think of my studio as a sanctuary a place where I go um to calm myself down and this was inviting all this stuff in so I I, I set the the rule and I finished and I went to the end of that day or that month and then I moved on to another project. So that's yes. Um, when do you know to start the editing process? Like when do you know to take that step? Or do you like edit continually? That's a good question. Um, um Sometimes it happens later. I mean, I don't think there, I have a set rule of that. I mean, even the ones that I showed you tonight are from a pile of a lot of similars. So um, you might say that because I only showed you a few that that was an editing, but I have all these others. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the drawings, not the not the newspaper thing is that I feel is a, an entire series and needs to be kept together as it is. Um, the other works. Um, I don't know, like the marble drawings I did and I might go back to them. So I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's yeah that's a really good question so it's almost like when i'm doing the reproduction i'm more of a technician. Um, than the creator. Um, but I'm also consider myself a conceptual artist, so the artist in the concept, not the actual um, execution. Yes. Have you always considered yourself a conceptual artist? Like when did you um, that's, a, um, that's also a good question. You guys are full of great questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Because even in my earliest work, going to go back to my undergrad, um, that was a conceptual work. Um, my foundational studies were um, in a conceptual art school. And I guess I never really stepped away. I mean, 
I did have like that 30 year period where I was shooting turkeys and pies, but um, I was also doing a lot of still life work then. So it took me a while to kind of get back to that conceptual work. I'm curious, Mary, did the, did the commercial work kind of, how did that affect the conceptual work? Like, was there a point that, of shooting turkeys and pies, that just kind of made you think this is as ridiculous as it is? Well, that's a really, you know, that was the thing. It's like, so shooting all that um, commercial work, there was a lot of art going on at the time that directly spoke to the production of those kind of images, like the whole pictures generation. So I was was looking at that, but I just felt it was too close to my skin. You know, and I also felt, you know, I liked that. I liked doing that work. It was a lot of fun. And I worked with a really great, amazing creative people, um, you know, because it was always a team effort to to produce those shoots. And um, I always felt it was a, if, to go that way would be a little bit like, um, what's the expression? Biting the hand that feeds you, you know? So I kind of just resisted. Plus that period of my life, I was working, raising children. You know, there wasn't a lot of space for playing in the studio. So, I, I, I'm not sure how I felt about it. I was just doing. Um, and when I wasn't shooting, I was really doing more still life work. Um, I mean, shooting commercially. So my personal work at that time was more still life. And then probably the, fir the, the reality TV was really the jump off point for me. Um, and actually, to get to your question, that's it. Because in the studio, everything is, um, in the commercial studio, everything is styled. Um, it's dictated by the creative director. Create, people bring in beautiful things. I mean, you, it'd be hard not to make a nice picture with everything they bring to the set. Um, so when I was doing my still life, it, that, it became hard for me to um, separate those two, like, like why that object? Why? And it, they just started to feel too precious and stylized to me. I couldn't quite separate it, so I made a break and started shooting light on the wall. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, this has been a great, great. I, you really have to say that my I've only been here like two weeks. It's, it's just such a great community to be part of, and I just really appreciate having been invited. Um, it's really a great honor, and um, I've felt very welcomed here. So thank you, thank you, everyone. Stop in and see the show if you have time. Oh, I'll do this for you. Oh, it's open. You did it.